I am going to tell you some stories this morning about configuration management and some stories about state and some stories about geese and how they can all work together to end up being really horrible. So who in here has played or at least heard of the Untitled Goose Game? Okay, good. So at least a few people in here will get these references. So the premise for those of you who have not played it or have somehow managed to stay off the internet recently is it is a lovely morning in the village and you are a horrible goose and your goal is to cause problems on purpose so you can break into people's gardens and steal their stuff and break their things and trip them and make them fall in puddles. It's great fun. Now, as engineers, we generally don't try to cause problems on purpose unless you're one of those offensive security engineers. But let's be real, who out there has accidentally caused problems not meaning to? Yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm currently an SRE on the Terraform cloud team at HashiCorp. I spent the better part of a year before this as a developer on the Terraform AWS provider. And then I've done operations for most of a decade before that. So I know at least several to a few things about Terraform. I'm very good at making bad puns and other bad jokes on the internet. And I've been, I just changed teams recently. I've been on the SRE team for two weeks now and I have not horrifically broken production. <laughs> thanks, thanks. I'm either doing something really right or really wrong. But when I first started out in operations, my career looked very, very different. I was working as a QA engineer for a really small startup in New York. And they had one sysadmin who quit for reasons that would later become obvious. And the managers kind of said to me, they're like, Rin, you've used Linux before, right? Can you go to the data center and keep it from burning to the ground? And I was like, I mean, I've used it, but I'm not a sysadmin. And they were like, that's nice. Here's your access card. Good luck. Have fun. <laughs> and so I inherited 200 Snowflake servers, beautiful and unique, absolutely zero automation, no config management, not even a bash script to keep me company. And somehow I was the least underqualified person who was now in charge of this data center. So at this point, I was basically a very new horrible goose who had gotten into the data center and I was ready to cause problems. I mean, make things better. So 200 servers is not a lot by any sort of you know, modern standards, but it is a big number for when you have to do everything completely by hand and have absolutely no idea what you're doing. There's a lot of state involved. So talking about state for a minute, if we take kind of a simplified look at the world, we can say, okay, we're doing things that are building and running applications for people, applications of some sort. So we care about application state. What is the application doing? And then the system state. So what is the system doing that is running the application? And if you kind of look at the history of configuration management in software, you see that really, really early tools focused on being able to compare and reproduce state. So you have things like diff that can compare state or make to try and reproducibly build the state that is needed to execute a program. CVS or SVN would give you ways to version state, and if you're sitting up there saying, well, those aren't config management, there is a Wikipedia page that says you're wrong. Now, application state is always going to be a thing, but luckily there are application developers who can worry about that sort of thing, so we'll just talk about system state for now. So back in the day, you might have had, you know, your one server running your entire LAMP stack sitting under somebody's desk somewhere, getting dusty. And then things were relatively easy because you just had the one system to configure. But as soon as applications and infrastructure started getting more complex and you had multiple systems to run everything, things got more complicated. So we have system state. What is the system doing? What is the system supposed to be doing? Because, you know, ideally those would be the same thing, but as we all know, they always aren't. What versions of things exist? What is and is not installed? 
early configuration management kind of gave us the ability to set up a baseline. So let's get the system into this known good state and maybe it'll stay there for a little while. We also want to know what has changed in the state, so getting some sort of diff. Ideally, maybe knowing when things changed, who made those changes, so you can go talk to them and be like, why did this change? Can, can, we, can we talk about this? And maybe there were some change control processes to try and prevent unapproved changes. So trying to take all of these things that go into system state and with config management, maybe we can make them a little less horrible. So back to my data center with my 200 beautiful and unique Snowflake servers, my precious, precious children. One of the first things I did was start trying to set up any automation at all. Actually started with doing some sort of physical inventory because when I went in, people were just like, here's the badges to the data center. We don't know what's in there. Maybe you could tell us. I found things like a load-bearing X-serve. That was an adventure. And so I'm in here trying to sort out, you know, what is the current state of the system? And then figure out, you know, working with the engineers, what is the system state supposed to be? And again, I inherited absolutely no automation or configuration management, so it was really just me running around with like a fire extinguisher, except the fire extinguisher is also on fire. <laughs> One of the first things that I did was set up a cobbler server, because when I started, I had a USB <coughs> DVD drive and a pile of CentOS DVDs that somebody had found in a drawer somewhere, and they were like, you should use these to install the servers. That'll work well. So I set up my cobbler server, and then I was like, okay, this, the, the engineers keep having me do the same things on all of these servers that I've installed. I'm going to write a bash script. It was better than nothing. The problem with bash scripts is that they don't really manage system state. I wrote a tool that was basically kind of a hammer that you could like hammer the systems kind of into this given baseline state. But things would fail or because this was a very professional environment and everyone had root access to SSH into servers, people would SSH into my servers, my precious and unique children, and do things to them. And then my bash script wouldn't work anymore. And then people would say to me, Rin, why is API 12 on fire? And I would say, I don't know. It's beautiful and unique. And its reasons for throwing a temper tantrum are vast and unknowable. What did you do to API 12 to make it so sad? Because I'm pretty sure it was fine yesterday. So yeah, drift happens, our baseline state changes, and I couldn't really get diffs with my bash script. I was kind of having to resort to poking around to see, talking to the engineer, see if they would tell me what they did. There was absolutely no sort of change control or any sort of process around that. And then one day I was complaining about this on Twitter, as one does. And somehow James Turnbull managed to find one of my tweets, and he worked at Puppet at the time, and he said, so I don't want to sound all salesy, but I, I have this thing called Puppet that feels like it would make your life a little less sad. Would you like a free book and maybe some stickers? And I was like, stickers? I love stickers. Shit, yeah. Sign me up. And so he sent me the Puppet book, and I was really excited. I was like, OK, I can, I can learn about this. I can start setting this up. And this all sounded great because I'm like, now when the devs SSH into my servers and change things, maybe Puppet's going to know what they're supposed to be doing and put stuff back. So here I was, getting ready to do some configuration management and definitely not cause any problems. <laughs> so I, I had this data center, this beautiful, lovely data center that was running its website and Okay, there were a lot of problems. It mostly worked occasionally. It, it was okay. And I'm getting ready to start implementing Puppet. And I started with, you know, some of the easy wins where I, I talked to the web developers and I'm like, okay, so it looks like Nginx is running. Nginx should continue to be running, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. Put that in Puppet, roll it out. Nginx continues to run. Everyone's happy. I'm doing this and I'm doing this and then one day I come along to Postfix and I notice that Postfix is installed on all of the servers and it has some what look like custom configurations not just the whatever's out of the box but it's not running anywhere and so I I ask all of the the, the devs I'm like hey 
should Postfix be running? And they're like, ooh, yeah. Postfix is going to email us whenever there's errors, and we want to know about those errors. We thought it had been a little quiet recently. <laughs> Definitely turn that on. <laughs> okay. So I'm going I'm to turn Postfix on. And this is, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I put the changes in Git and I got a code review and some nice stuff like that. And I was like, okay, we have this known system state. Postfix is off. And this known configuration change, Postfix is going to turn on and it's going to be the new known system state where Postfix is on and everyone's happy. <laughs> Except no. So I rolled out this change in Puppet, and Puppet was like, yep, I've applied your change, good job. And then everything fell offline, just completely offline. The site was down, couldn't SSH into any machines. There were emails everywhere. It turned out there had been eight years uh. of emails. <laughs> yeah. Just eight years of emails sitting on each of these 200 Snowflake servers. And then they all sent at once and it just saturated literally every link in that data center and it all just caught on fire. <laughs> what? So our known state was not actually as known as we thought it was. We knew the system state that Postfix was off, but we didn't know the application state where we had eight years of queued emails. And like, yes, in, in retrospect, maybe we should have checked that, but nobody thought to do that at the time. Configuring, so configuring the system state change didn't account for this unknown application state, and it was one of those things where there really wasn't an undo button. Like, sure, I could have reverted that commit in the Puppet repo, but you couldn't unsend those emails and we were just like, okay, so we can't SSH into any of the boxes. I guess I could go to the data center and take my keyboard and plug it into each server individually and like turn off postfix, clear the queue, do all of that. But there were so many emails and eventually we just decided let's just leave the emails. They'll finish sending eventually. Look how many errors they are. We found them. <laughs> If there's one thing we learned here, it's that we can't be rid of application state so easily. Turns out we, we don't have to be application developers, but we do sometimes have to have some sort of idea of what the application state is and how that is going to interact with system state. So we care about similar sorts of things for application state as for system state. What is it doing? What does it care about? What is its view of the world? A lot of this stuff can be internal to the application that we don't have to worry about, but sometimes we do, and we don't always know in advance when we do have to care about it. Again, we want to know what things changed, when, who changed them. An application state can be especially fun because there's things like caches or queues that add more layers of complexity that definitely never cause things to go unexpectedly. Okay, so we've learned that Puppet is how I set things on fire and we should just never use computers, I'm pretty sure is the lesson here. <coughs> More realistically, don't forget about your application state and don't forget about the unknown unknowns. Because you know, the known knowns and the known unknowns are relatively easy, but it's the things where you don't know until everything has caught on fire and you're like, in retrospect, we should have uh, thought of that, write that down for next time. So, we've done some horrible things. Now, to be fair, a non-zero amount of that particular story was, that was my very first ops job. I was a very small, horrible goose. I had no idea what I was doing. I think it's safe to say that if you, as an engineering org, leave just 200 beautiful, smoldering Snowflake servers on fire, that maybe there's some lack of rigor overall. None of us knew exactly what we were doing there. So let's fast forward a few years to a time when I knew a lot more. Now I'm telling these stories not just so you can laugh at my pain, it is numerous and hilarious though, but to illustrate that like these are complex systems that we're dealing with and even teams full of smart people who ostensibly know what they're doing can end up doing things that we don't intend to. So several years later, I'm working at Etsy, I've got a team of really smart people like the ops team at Etsy was fantastic. 
I was working on a t thing called Project Indigo, which was Etsy's um, provisioning for hardware in the data center. So at the time, Etsy was almost entirely in their own data centers, had data center teams who would go and you know rack the servers and plug everything in. Um, Project Indigo was then designed to, it was a Peter Gabriel naming scheme. Etsy was really into fun names, don't worry about it. Um, this was, this was a tool set that was designed to get to the point so when the data center team had like racked up a server and cabled everything the right way and powered it on, it would bootstrap itself and install an operating system and configure itself in the network and do everything to get itself to the point where it could be a useful server in the world and do something nice and productive with its life. So I was working on this infrastructure, this uh, server provisioning. And that meant I needed a test server to do some of the end-to-end -end testing to make sure that it actually did the thing and provision the server. And I'm going along and I'm doing this, and it's mostly working, and it's mostly working except for my code keeps breaking because, I don't know, I keep writing bugs in it. Why would I do that? And then one day, right after lunch, I'm running my provisioning, and Chef fails. I'm like, oh, it was so close. Chef is at the very end of this provisioning. We're getting really close. Why is it failing? I don't want to downgrade the Apache version. So we had a local yum mirror that pulled down the latest versions of various packages. And at some point, like while we were at lunch, it had pulled down a point release of Apache. And that was like one point release newer than the version that we had configured in Chef. And I said, okay, we've run into this before because this was what the yum repo did is it pulled down all of these changes and then deleted the old ones. You can debate whether or not that was the smartest thing to do, but that's what we did. And so I'd seen this before, we'd seen this pattern before, and I was like, okay, it's a point release. Test it locally, does the right thing. Great, gonna bump the version in Chef, and the way that Chef was configured was that this change was only gonna impact new machines. This had the side effect of the, there was a lot of like version drift across the fleet. So servers that had pro been provisioned months or years before, had older versions of Chef or whatever package than newer provisioned servers. But we knew this and this was the trade-off that people had decided to make. Point was, we had done this before. So we had this perfectly nice website, all of these Apache web servers, just running the website, doing their thing. Again, we had done this a bunch of times before. And it had always been a no-op before, so we were relatively unconcerned about how this change was going to go. Had this known config state, we had this no-op, and so we were going to end up with the same known config state. And then I was going to get to move on with my provisioning testing, and everything was going to be fine. Except no. So what happened was I rolled out the change, and then I was like, you know, just for fun, I should log into one of the web servers and make sure that Chef is doing a no-op. You can see where this is going. I logged into one of the web servers and Chef upgraded Apache and then Chef and Apache fell over. It couldn't start Apache back up and I'm like, oh, this is gonna roll out everywhere in like the next 10 minutes. And I turned to my, the guy sitting next to me who was our on-call person at the time and I'm like, so you're about to get paged a lot. That's my bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm, uh, let, let's try and fix it here. And everyone was really wonderful and supportive. But Chef had done this upgrade that it was not supposed to do, and then it was complaining about this config file that was or was not supposed to be there, and everything is on fire, except somehow the site was still up. It was really incredibly slow, but it was still up. We were just like, what? What just happened here? So, a bunch of really smart people all jumped in to help. It was, you know, a really, nobody, nobody yelled at me and was like, why did you do this? We just got back from lunch. Why are you this horrible goose? Everyone, you know, jumped in and asked, like, how can I help? How can we troubleshoot this? Eventually, what we think we figured out is that there was an Apache sub-module that had an unpinned version, and somehow these kind of colluded with this chef change to cause the upgrade across the entire infrastructure, even though it was a pinned version that was not supposed to be upgraded. That was, that was our best hypothesis. Now I mentioned that the site stayed up. It turns out that there were seven servers where the chef run was failing before it got to the Apache cookbook. <laughs> Those seven servers were running a test of PHP 7 at the time, 
and we discovered accidentally that seven PHP 7 servers could keep Etsy.com running in the middle of the day. That was an adventure. <laughs> And then there was this, so we had this unknown and inconsistent configuration state across all of the infrastructure, which, okay, it turned out to be good in this particular instance, but also it might have been good to know that, you know, Chef isn't running everywhere that we think it is. And then we had, obviously, there is no root cause, but a big part of this issue was the fact that this source repo, this yum mirror, was kind of unattended and uncontrolled and it just kind of did its thing and upgraded packages and deleted the old ones and th so this pattern of oh there's a newer thing in the mirror that's in chef now we have to bump chef blah 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 this happened a lot but it had never been catastrophic enough that people were like we should fix this but these these two things got out of sync a lot so you had the version in chef and the version in yum and they they collided and sometimes that went better and worse than other times so now we can add kind of two new types of state, configuration state, and here we're talking about the various components of configuration management systems. So you have, you know, your chef recipes in this case. Uh, we had the, you know, chef servers database, what it knew internally is its state of the world, and then various versions of, you know, the chef client. And due to historical package drift related reasons, there may or may not have been different chef client versions in play here too. Always a good time. And we have source state, so whatever inputs to not just the configuration management system, but the system as a whole that ultimately help create you know, the application as it runs. So yum repositories, git repositories of the app, git repos of chef, whatever. And this whole system when it is executed creates the application state. So, configuration state, what have humans put into, you know, chef recipes, what are, what are the people trying to tell the configuration management system to do, what does it know internally about its state of the world, and kind of how is it running, and this can be internally inconsistent if you aren't careful. And then source state, like I said, all of the inputs to the system you can put in in, config, in source control really can become a p part of your source state. So that's all, all going to come together to create the application state. So we have some more things that can go into state that can cause problems here. That particular incident with the Apache upgrade was so epic that I won an award for it. Uh, Etsy had a thing called the Three-Armed Sweater Award that was given out every year to the engineer who broke production in the most interesting way. <laughs> and despite the fact that, okay, technically I didn't break production because those seven web servers meant that the website was still up and running, but apparently that counted enough and I got a lovely three-armed sweater for my trouble. So some things that, that we learned here. Monitor your configuration state. Again, just because having seven servers where Chef was failing ended up kind of saving our, our butts a little bit. In this particular case does not mean that you should do that as a general rule. Please make sure that you don't leave seven servers out just in case. And don't leave your states unsupervised. This would have been a very different situation if we had been, you know, at least manually confirming that like, oh yes, this is pulling down a new version. Let's have some sort, of, some sort of sensible process for putting that new Apache version into production aside from, well, the yum mirror said we're gonna upgrade, so I guess we're gonna upgrade today. So gonna move on now to a slightly different class of this infrastructure's code configuration management. Gonna talk about Terraform. And I feel like I should put on my HashiCorp hat right now and be like, Terraform is great. <laughs> Not gonna cause any problems with it at all. So this story is from when I was working at Travis, and again, I had a, a team full of really smart colleagues, and we had some tested tooling, some tested deploy processes. Uh, I was not actually the one who like pressed the button on this, but I was I was working with my teammate who who did, and she gave me permission to tell this lovely story. We were working on our Mac infrastructure, so for every time that you, you know, were trying to do a Mac build on Travis CI, it ran on this infrastructure. 
And at the time, this was using a company called Mac Stadium that I think essentially had a bunch of like Mac pros in a data center somewhere. And we got to use some of them as our infrastructure. So ultimately, I mean, yes, it's all servers there somewhere, but um, the, the Mac infrastructure was always a lot closer to the servers than like Amazon Cloud or Google Cloud that we used for the Linux part of the Travis infrastructure. So we didn't touch it that often because, you know, it was hardware. It was a lot more of a pain to deal with. But one day we were like, okay, more customers are using this. That's great. We need to up the capacity of the infrastructure a little bit. We need to make a config change. But it was hardly a config change. Like we were making one number bigger, just one number. It's a really nice Mac infrastructure we had there. It would really be a shame if some horrible goose were to happen to it. So we had this known system state where we had the Mac infrastructure of a particular size and this known config change, which was barely a config change, just one number. It was just going to get a little bit bigger. Everything was going to be fine. And we were going to have this new system state where there was just going to be slightly more of the system, right? Except no. We did, we did the Terraform plan and the Terraform plan looked okay. And it said, oh yeah, we're gonna add some things. We're gonna de destroy zero things. And we were like, great, zero to destroy, some things to add, that sounds good. Terraform apply. And then the Mac server started going away and we were like, what, what, what are you doing? You said you weren't gonna destroy anything. <laughs> and the, the servers just keep going away and then we try and rerun Terraform and Terraform is just like, no, absolutely not. Cannot do that. We were using like Terraform taint and Terraform untaint. Nobody's super clear as to what happened, but at some point in an effort to get the infrastructure up and running so that, you know, customers could use it, we were trying to like manually edit the Terraform state in S3. And I think at one point, like in the Terraform config, it was like Mac infra dash V2 dash final dash final dash please, please work dot TF state. <laughs> so this goose is just over here. Terraform's just like, no, no, this is my infrastructure now. You can't have any. What? What we ultimately kind of figured out must have been the thing that happened is some wildly and unknowably different configuration states that were not fully captured in the source state. So what we eventually kind of figured out is that somebody had done a Terraform apply from some changes that never got checked into Git. So normally we tried to be like, okay, we should deploy from the head of master. So, you know, we're apply applying a known state, a known set of changes. This had apparently not happened at some point in the past. So we had completely unknown changes that had gotten applied to the infrastructure and trying to like reverse engineer the diffs of what had changed. And then there was the fact that whoever had done this had used Terraform 0.9 and we were on 0.10 and if you don't know anything about Terraform numbering, the, th th those are major versions, like that was a very big difference and Terraform was just like, excuse you, no, I cannot handle this, what are you even trying to do? It was very upset by those version differences and because, you know, there was no Terraform server, like a chef server that had its one view of the world, we were stuck trying to like reverse engineer this from this state file that was in S3. And then on top of all that, we couldn't discount the fact that something in the Terraform plan output might have told us this and it got lost in the scroll back because we kind of glanced over and it was like 10,000 lines of output, but it said like two to add, zero to destroy, and we're like, that looks fine. So now on top of everything else, we have to add Terraform state which is like the application state that's holding your configuration state and all of the info about your system state. And then you just take that and you put it in an S3 bucket because there's no problem in the world that can't be made better by putting it in S3. <laughs> Fun fact, all three S's in S3 stand for sadness. That is our sadness, sadness, sadness bucket. <laughs> Thank you. I'm mostly kidding about that. Terraform state, despite being called Terraform state, is really just configuration state. I'm not kidding about the sadness. The sadness is real. <laughs> okay, great. So we've caused a lot of problems in a lot of data centers now. A lot of th th that particular story could have maybe been prevented, again, hindsight bias. If we had done things like have 
a central deploy server or failing that some sort of check that said, hey, you should really be deploying from the master branch and not whatever random uncommitted changes you have on your laptop, YOLO. Or by making sure that you know everyone was running the same Terraform version. And eventually we put some of those checks into the make file that we ran as part of this. But ideally you would make those sorts of, you know, whatever constraints you feel like you need to have in place, have that be done by design and not by punishment. So blameless, blame aware culture, we know that even really well intentioned, smart people can mess up, even processes that we think we know can have unintended con consequences. So I think building awareness of that into your tools and workflows from the beginning is, is important. Don't do things like take away permissions and lock things down more and more and more after every incident because you don't learn from that. It makes everything harder and it creates this really broken and toxic culture of fear. One time I worked at a place many, many years ago where the ops team had to use puppet exec to execute like any command that we needed to do to do our jobs because the executive and management team after every incident basically just took away pseudo access to whichever command had caused the problem and so the only thing that the ops team had pseudo permission to do was to run puppet except they forgot about puppet exec so we just puppet exec everything but that was not exactly a healthy culture so We've talked about a lot of different things that you can do with configuration management to cause problems. Again, we should just throw computers in the bin. They're not worth it. But the important thing to actually take away here is to, to realize that, like, yes, these are complex problems in complex systems. And that for the most part, people don't come to work trying to do a bad job. People are you know, again, ex except for those offensive security engineers, people are generally not horrible geese. None of these situations happened because people were trying to mess up. Like, I didn't come into work on any of these days and be like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make everyone have a real bad day. So even with more and more robust configuration management solutions, and there were a lot of details that I glossed over in here for the sake of time, but there were things like staging environments and tested deploy processes and tests that ran. It's not like we actually were YOLOing everything except for that very first, first time. But things can still go wrong. So in addition to all of these kind of computery sources of state, we have to add in human state. What is the state of the humans who are interacting with these tools? Are they tired? Are they stressed out? Is it three in the morning? Is it three in the afternoon and they have been firefighting since three in the morning because something went horribly, horribly wrong? Like the reason that we went from nothing to bash scripts to chef to terraform to whatever is to hopefully make it easier for ourselves to do the right thing, but also harder for us to do the wrong thing. So I'm gonna stop talking about state for a minute and talk about human factors instead. I'm gonna have a human factors picnic. Human factors is about considering the behavioral and psychological characteristics of humans and how those characteristics interact with the jobs that people are trying to do and the tools they're trying to use to do those jobs. It is a whole field of study. I don't have time to do it justice here. But when we are looking at these stories of horrible configuration geese, we can try and come up with a few human factors considerations that we should think about when we are designing configuration management tools and workflows. So fewer sources of state, I think, is a good one. I've seen places that are saying like, oh yeah, we've got Chef and Puppet running, and then we put some Terraform, and then we put some Ansible in there. Maybe don't do that. <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm not going to come up here and see, like, say, like, there's a blanket statement and, and there's never any exception to this. There might be an exception. I am struggling to think of one. The fewer different tools that you have that are working on the same state, probably the better. Uh, looking back at, like, the chef example, we could have had um, one config that managed the versions that were available in both yum and chef, one source of state instead of two. Maybe a centralized Terraform in the, in the Travis Mac infrastructure example instead of everyone doing it from their own laptop. 
This is when I put on my Hashi hat again and be like, this is why Terraform Cloud exists, to stop horrible geese from doing this exact thing. And then watch out for things that are providing incorrect state, because sometimes that can be even worse than just having no state information available at all. Who here has been dealing with an incident and you fall back to SSHing into a machine and poking it with a stick? Yeah. People can say on Twitter all they want that if you have people SSHing into servers in production, something has gone wrong and you should just take away their SSH keys and nobody should do that. But there is a reason that we keep falling back to this and a lot of times it comes down to the tools, the other tools that we have don't feel reliable. Like they don't feel like they're surfacing all the information that we need or they're feeling too difficult to use when everything is on fire and you can't remember, you know, whatever commands you need to run or something like that. So we had things like Puppet wasn't surfacing all of the information we needed, Chef behaving inconsistently, Terraform being its inscrutable, mysterious self. And it's this struggle of just like SSHing into the computer and being like, why are you doing this? Like, what is happening? So we need to find out when we look at our tooling, what engineers are actually trying to do in the day to day and what tools and processes they're using and which they're working around. Again, finding ways to surface incorrect or inconsistent state. Ideally, so you know you can know that things are about to go horribly wrong and then maybe make a different choice where they don't. But you know, it's, it's hindsight bias is always gonna be there. But there is uh, something to be said for trying to find ways to surface this information, especially in bigger and more complex infrastructures like, like we tend to have these days. So in the chef example, we had, we had a graph. We, we hypothetically could have known that you know, those seven servers weren't running chef. That information was technically available. But every, so every developer had their own VM and they tended to turn off chef on their VM so that they could you know, test changes and not have chef come stomp all over them. And so in the graph of chef runs just across the top, there was this little line of red that was all of the developer VMs. And so we got used to that. We're like, oh yeah. Don't worry about that red stripe. If the red stripe gets bigger, then we should worry. But when you had you know, a couple hundred developer VMs as this little red stripe, seven more servers not running Chef, it was a pixel maybe at that. So we didn't have useful ways to surface that kind of incorrect or inconsistent state there. And this is kind of about balance, like trying to figure out how to surface information in a way that is actionable, but not overwhelming. And finally, making sure that we're writing tools that make sense to humans, not just to computers. So if you have you know, a Terraform plan that spews you know, thousands and thousands of lines of output and you have to you know, scroll through and scroll through and try and figure out which two lines in that output is gonna tell you that by the way, you're about to break everything, that's not super human friendly, even in the best of times, let alone when something is going wrong and you're in a hurry and you just wanna get the site back up. We, we want to make sure that our tools have useful output that's somewhere in between no output and 70 bajillion debug log lines. Good luck, have fun. So again, it's designing about human readability and human usability in mind, but not just in the day-to-day. -day. Make sure that these things work, test these workflows in, you know, not em emergencies, but, you know, game days, that sort of thing. So that when things are on fire, you know that you your tools are gonna to be working with you instead of against you. So, we have thought about a lot of ways that people might use configuration management tools and how we can make them more usable by humans. What does the future of configuration management look like? What are we gonna put on our little Yoda spatula, spatulas next? I've seen teams do things like write more and more custom tooling around existing config management tools. So if you have, for example, a bunch of different environments that are each managed by Terraform, each one having a little customized wrapper script. So you have a similar workflow, but slight separation under the hood. Or I've seen people go kind of a different way and do everything being really, really short-lived immutable infrastructure. So lambdas or containers that only last as long as a few requests. So there's less running state that you have to try and manage and juggle up in the air and more, we can just build it fresh from the source state and go kind of more directly from source state to application state. Maybe it looks like something else, I don't know. 
So we want to get rid of tools that are unreliable or find, them, find ways to make them more reliable by the people actually using them. And then remembering that we use configuration management to try and make our lives less horrible as human operators. We're not trying to mess up. We're not trying to be horrible geese and do a bad job and set things on fire. But these are complex systems that we're working with, with lots of inputs and interactions and states. And so we should try as much as we can to design the systems and tools with that in mind. Make it easier to do the right thing, make it harder to do the wrong thing, and make it easier to use if a horrible goose gets into your data center. Thank you.